Last week, we talked about the arc itself. We talked about the building of the structure and so on. Everything that we're looking at is based in the Answers in Genesis uh, structure that they have in Kentucky. Tonight, we're going to talk about the animals on the ark and about that. Last week, it was basically the structure. But before we do, we have to go to God's Word. So we are going to go through and we're going to read through chapter 7, which explains or shows us a lot of things we have to look at. And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark. For thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Of every clean beast thou shalt take to thee by sevens, the male and his female, and of beasts that are not clean by two, the male and his female. Of fowls also of the air by sevens, the male and the female, to keep seed alive upon the face of all the earth. For yet seven days, and I will cause it to rain upon the earth forty days and forty nights, and every living substance that I have made will I destroy from off the face of the earth. And Noah did according unto all that the Lord commanded him. And Noah was six hundred years old, and the flood of waters was upon the earth. And Noah went in, and his sons and his wife, and his sons' wives with him into the ark, because of the waters of the flood, of clean beasts, and of beasts that are not clean, and of fowls, and of everything that creeps upon the earth. There went in two and two unto Noah into the ark, the male and the female, as God had commanded Noah. And it came to pass after seven days that the waters of the flood were upon the earth. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened. <clears throat> and the rain was upon the earth forty days and forty nights. In the selfsame day entered Noah and Shem and Ham and Japheth, the sons of Noah and Noah's wife, and the three wives of his sons with them into the ark. They and every beast after his kind, and all the cattle after their kind, and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth after his kind, and every fowl after his kind, every bird of every sort. And they went in unto Noah into the ark, two and two of all flesh, wherein is the breath of life. And they that went in, went in male and female of all flesh, as God had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. And the flood was forty days upon the earth, and the waters increased and bore up the ark, and it was lift up above the earth. And the waters prevailed and were increased greatly upon the earth. And the ark went upon the face of the waters. And the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth. And all the high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered. Fifteen cubits upward did the waters prevail. And the mountains were covered. And all flesh died that moved upon the earth. Both of fowl and of cattle and of beast and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth and every man. All in whose nostrils was the breath of life, of all that was in the dry land, died. And every living substance was destroyed which was upon the face of the ground, both man and cattle and the creeping things, and the fowl of the heavens. And they were destroyed from the earth. And Noah only remained alive, and they that were with him in the ark. And the waters prevailed upon the earth 150 days. As we read through that, there's many different things. Um, for example, uh, it says on a certain day, a certain month, that the flood started. Most of you may not know, some of you may know, but those are exactly the same days that the Israelites crossed the Red Sea. They came into their land. They were given their commandments at the same time. When he gives you a date and a time in the Bible, it's, there's a purpose for it. And it carries on throughout the Bible. So there's very good significance to almost everything that we hear. Many things in there that we're going to get into. We're looking at animals this time. We're not going to get into the ark so much, but we're going to look at the animals. So, the first question is, how many animals would have been on the ark? Anybody got any idea? We're going to get into that. Okay, it says, unclean beasts by two, clean beasts by seven. Now, what's the next question? What's the difference between clean and unclean? Leviticus 11 defines that difference between clean and unclean animals. So, clean animals. Anybody want to venture a guess what clean animals are? Alright, first thing is, they are land animals that chew the cud and have a divided hoof. 
They are also seafood with both fins and scales. Certain birds are clean. Some insects are clean. I'm going to ask you another question after when we get through these unclean animals. What are unclean animals? Land animals that either do not chew the cut or do not have a split hoof. Seafood lacking either fins or scales. Some birds. Some other animals. Why did God give clean and unclean animals to the Israelites? Sacrifice. Pardon? Health things, health issues. Health is yeah. the most important thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why could they not eat pig, for example? Pigs don't have a split hoop, they don't chew the cut. Of course. Unless they are properly cooked, and instead of trying to teach them how to cook and prepare these things, it's easy to say, no. What about lobster and all these kind of things that everybody loves these days? Why can't you eat lobster? Yeah, They're scavenger. bottom scavengers, right? So these things that go on the bottom to clean the oceans and so on and keep everything clean, there's all kinds of parasites and everything with that. So it's easier for people, when God's trying to get them to do things, it's easier just to say, no. So that's where the division comes in there. That's the most important part. The next thing is, what is meant by after their kinds? He said that he would take in animals after their kind, creeping things after their kind, birds after their kind. What is a kind? Anybody got an idea? Incidentally, pardon? Sort of a type, a type of animal. Explain that a bit further. Well, I, uh, if, if it's a dog, it would probably be just a wolf, and not a poodle, and all their other little sub things. Okay. Yeah. If you list these poodle, terrier, shepherd, fox, wolf, jackal, dingo, they are all of the same kind. They're all dogs. All right? They are called a dog kind. Simple. Here's another example. If you take a lion, a tiger, a panther, a leopard, a kitty cat, they are all of the same kind known as the cat kind. Animals can come together. I used this example last week of it. Um, what is a mule? It's from a horse and a donkey. Which way? Female horse, male donkey. Why? Sorry. If you took a male horse and put it in a donkey, the donkey would die. The animal would be so big. So it doesn't work that way because the donkey is so much smaller than that. The other thing is many of these kind of animals are sterile. Mules are sterile. Now, when you take these things, you can take a lion and a tiger and put them together. If you take I don't know which way it goes, but you take the male to female one way and you get a liger, and if you go the other way, it's a tie-on. They have actually made these animals. They are there. Now here's an example. This is called a growler bear. They have actually bred these in captivity, and they have found one in Canada, up in the north, that was a natural, uh, a natural birth. You can tell it's it's got a whitish color, but the big hump on the back the right, is the indication there. So that's a growler bear, and they're part of the bear family. So they come together different ways. I mentioned this one last week. I've seen one of those. A zombie, right? It's a zebra and a donkey. He has his socks on. So, yeah. so again, there are many different animals that go together. And as they put them together, they put them into things called uh, kinds. When Answers in Genesis started back, oh, 10 or 15 years ago, considering building an ark, they had to look at these <coughs> kinds. What are the kinds? And they got together many people in, that are in veterinarian services and so on. And they have created a whole new study called baromenology. Does anybody know of baromenology? I think I mentioned that last week. What's baromenology? All right, let's break it down. What's ology? 
O L O G Y. The study of what's Bara? <coughs> it's a Hebrew word that means created. And min, Bara, minology, min is a Hebrew word that means kind. The study of created kinds. So there are many people now that are involved in this. And one of the astounding things, whether you look at the Institute for Creation Research or Answers in Genesis, is that many, many, many young people that are looking on how they want to take their life ahead. They're in university. Well, what am I going to study? You know, they start looking at university programs, at PhDs and so on. What am I going to study? More and more and more people are getting involved in these things. More and more people are getting involved in the creation science. They're not Christians, but they're looking at it because it's so different. And there's so many things that are being found out that they're now starting to do more studies of. This is a whole new field of study that veterinarian and animal people are now looking at. The study of created kinds, baromenology. So, the next question comes because he said he would take the animals on the ark after their kind. <coughs> the question now comes, how many kinds were there? Are there? Which way? In the past, and this started back about 1950s and 1960s. Uh, Henry Morris, uh, he was the founder of the Institute for Creation <coughs> Research. He wrote a book. And he's one of the first ones to publish this, but he put it together that they estimated that there were between five and 6,000 kinds of animals. And when they put this together, they estimated that there would be about 16,000 um, um, animals. But, I've jumped ahead one here. They have been doing more and more studies now. And these new studies that they've done in the last 10 to 15 years are suggesting that there's less than 1,400 kinds. 1,400 kinds. So now, if you take these past things, and they've always considered in the past that there would be about 16,000 animals that would have been on the ark. The new studies are now saying less than 7,000 animals. Now, how do they come up with these kinds? First of all, as we start looking at this, they have to consider living animals. So, as they looked at living animals, they have to look at amphibians, 194 kinds, reptiles, 101 kinds, birds, 195 kinds, mammals, 137 kinds, and then based on clean and un <coughs> excuse me, based on clean and unclean, those are the total number of animals that would be on the earth. So you can see that most of the birds, there are seven of all those different ones, seven pairs, and so they got huge numbers. Whereas in the amphibians, that's an unclean animal. It's double, 194 times two comes up to 388. So basically, they go through these things, and those are living animals today. But what about 4,500 years ago, at the time of the flood? There were animals that were extinct. So they looked at fossils, the same thing. And you'll see that they have to estimate some of these, obviously, the synapses of the dinosaurs and so on. So as they get into this, they have to estimate based on what fossils and what things they found so far. So they come up with all of these different numbers, going through all of these different things. And we get a total of 6,658 animals, according to the best estimates today, on this. Now, there's huge studies. I've got videotapes and so on that show how they get into these studies. They're very, very detailed. So, <coughs> if anybody is ever really interested in uh, looking at all of these different kinds and how they do it and how they study them, I've got information. All you got to do is ask, and I can give you information. Now, <coughs> so we have 7,000 animals. How much space? would you need to put 7,000 animals? Good question. Remember last week, I didn't bring it this week. Last week, for those that weren't here, I brought a little porcelain thing of a Noah's Ark. And it opens up and it shows these animals and there's giraffes on the top and elephants hanging over the side and so on. And I said that every one of those things should be taken and tossed in a garbage can. Because what you're doing is you're telling kids and people that this is only a fairy tale. They need to show them, thank you, need to show them a full-size art, a real thing. And then we need to consider the animals that he would take on the ark. 
Why would Noah take a full-grown elephant that's 20 or 30 years old on the ark? You take one that's six months old. They're tiny little things. They're small, right? You don't take old ones that are big. You take the young ones because they have to live after the flood and they've got to procreate. Right? Most people in here aren't going to be procreating. Okay? Some are, but not all. Because we're too old. And so it's the same with animals. They don't procreate after a certain time. So you take the young ones, and they, as they're young, they're very small. Dinosaurs, people say, well, how could you take a Tyrannosaurus Rex on there? Right? Wait a minute. They come out of an egg. They're small. Right? The other thing is, um, all of these things have to be able to go out and go after you. Why don't we have dinosaurs today? Anybody got any idea? If you listen to National Geographic, they have what are called DDTs, Dinosaur Demise Theories. There's about 300 of them, right? There was a, a comet hit the Earth. There was AIDS hit the dinosaurs. That killed them all. That's another one I've heard. There's hundreds of these different Dinosaur Demise Theories. Dinosaurs came off the ark after the flood, and they lived with people in Texas, in Glen Rose, Texas. I've been there and I've seen them. There are dinosaur footprints with human footprints inside. The human footprints show it was an adult, looks like probably a father, with a young boy holding his hand. Because you can see this young boy is jumping from one step to the other. The father is walking and these steps are there. And this boy is trying to jump from one footprint to the, uh, one footprint to the next. Secular scientists said, that's nonsense. People never lived 65 million years ago. They died out 65 million years ago. Somebody come along and they carved into these things, um, you know, these footprints. So the, it's the Creation Science Museum in Glen Rose, Texas. They literally took one of these footprints of the rock. They cut it in half right through the middle. And when you study these things, if it was chipped, it, dirt when it forms is like little layers, right? It hardens up and these little granular layers. And what would happen is, is if you cut it, you would cut through these lines. So you'd see them come up and then it would be stopped right there. But what happens is these lines literally deform around. That footprint was put in the mud in a dinosaur footprint. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. And they said, well, the guys, the guys at the Creation Science Museum said, you pick a spot. You can see the track that this is going. There was actually a track. They got it. And they said, you find a place where you want to dig to see what's under the ground. And they said, right over there. So they went to the farmer that was there next door to this park, and they got permission to go there on a Saturday and excavate to see if there were more footprints. And guess what they found? More dinosaur footprints with human footprints inside. And all of the media was there as they dug into it. Virgin ground. It was never reported because they said, ah, oh, nobody cares anymore. Anyway. So people turn around and say, well, people never lived with dinosaurs. The real reason I believe dinosaurs died out is number one, it was a totally different world after the flood. Up until the flood, Methuselah lived 969 years. He died in the same year that the flood started. After the flood, you notice if you, if you plot all the ages of people, the ages dropped off dramatically, right, after that. Um, and the dinosaurs would have been the same thing because it was a totally different world. But that's not all. What's the thing that's killing most of the animals on the earth today? People. Humans. They want to go out and shoot things. They want to get a trophy. What makes us think that it's any different back then? There's a great big dinosaur, right? Let's go and get it. So, I believe most of the dinosaurs were died and were killed off by people. Um, anyway, we're looking at how much space is needed. 16,000 animals, if you took that, would use up less than half of the total space available without tearing. Tearing means stacking on top of each other. It means if you just laid everything on the floor, it would take half the space in the earth. Would take less than that. 16,000 animals. That's what they've been basing this thing on 
for the last 50 or 60 years. It's only in the last few years that they've come up with this new number. But here's an interesting thing. Only 11% of the animals were bigger than a small sheep. That's not very big. 11% would have been bigger than just a, you know, like, would have been like a, a big dog, right? But here's the most interesting thing that I found. The median size. The median size means that half are bigger and half are smaller. A small rat. Half of the animals were smaller than a rat. Amazing when you stop and think about it. So what do we show on these fairy tale things, these pictures, these nursery classes where they have a Noah's Ark on the wall? We show these great big giraffes, we show elephants, we show all these monster things. And yet half of them were smaller than a rat. And only 11% were bigger than a, little, a big dog. Okay? So, but now it's only estimated there's 7,000 animals. So again, 16,000 took up half the space. 7,000 takes up a lot less, again. <coughs> the, the point is, there's lots of room in that ark for everything. But now, uh, God also said to Noah, you need to take on enough food and water. When you look at the water, people said, well, it was raining. They could collect water. Maybe they did. But answers in Genesis, and these people that are doing the study said, we are going to go on the worst case scenario that nothing was collected, that everything had to be taken on the earth. Right? That, and that's what all the calculations are based on. Nothing was collected. They probably did collect it. Many things you get into as you look at these things. So he said you have to have food for them and for yourselves as you went on the earth. What's the first thing we remember about Genesis about the animals and the people. What did they eat? Vegetables. Everybody was a vegetarian. Right? The animals had the grasses and the herbs and the shrubs, and the people had the trees and the fruits and so on. Right? So they were all vegetarians. People said, well, how would you carry enough for a lion? You'd have to carry all this meat. No, you don't have to carry meat for a lion because at that time they were not. I did mention last week that because of the violence that was on the earth, some people think that perhaps the animals were literally eating each other or killing each other. They believe that men were killing each other, that there was murder, and that they may have been eating flesh. May have. But yet God created every animal and person to live on a vegetarian diet. So on the ark, they wouldn't have to take meat. It would be all dried stuff, hay and grains and so on. They had 371 days when you put it all together that were on the ark. They've estimated for all of these different animals that they would take 1,990 tons of food. That's all dry food. The water estimated for all of these animals would be take up less than 10% of the ark. The total volume on that ark, less than 10% of it, would be taken up by water. So, how do they carry the water and how do they carry the food stuff? I showed you these pictures last week. This is a representation of how they might carry water. These are amphora um, that are all staked up. And again, you can imagine, but they're just showing you know, certain pieces here, but you can imagine that there would be rooms full of these things that they can take out anytime they need. Similarly, the grain and the foods would all be kept up in some kind of sacks. They would all be stacked in these different places. They could stack that in there. And there was plenty of room in there for all of these things. But now, we have animals that are eating and drinking. And what do they make? Waste. They have waste. <coughs> what do you do with the waste products? You get rid of it. How do you do it? <laughs> okay. First thing is, if you take 16,000 animals, there would be one and a half tons of manure daily. But they would not clean enclosures one at a time. Just because you've got 7,000 animals, or if we put them two of them together, that we say 3,500, they're not going to clean 3,500 cages. How many people have ever seen rabbits? I used to live with a family that raised rabbits. Right? How do they clean them? 
They're basically a wire cage and everything falls through the bottom. Right? So you'll see, I've got pictures later on, you'll see this stuff. You put a cage here and you put a ramp underneath it here. You put another cage under it with a ramp under it. And you put another cage down here and another one under it. So that all of the matter would come off and run out and run down into one area. Right? And I'll show you this picture later on to explain how some of that stuff would work. So, they wouldn't clean them all at once, they would just basically be able to come down and do hundreds of these things all at once. What would they do with it? They could dump it overboard. They could take these things in wheelbarrows and just wheel it to some point. And there's all kinds of ways they show you how this would work on the, on the ark. Vermicomposting. They would have vermin, there could be some kind of bacteria, there could be whatever that they would uh, compost it, right? Basically you're just dumping it in a pile and making fertilizer if you wanted to do that. The other thing is you could let it accumulate. When we say accumulate, that means it just builds up. How long were they on the ark? 371 days, right? So there's a lot of that. But there's a study. Chickens, laying hens. They allowed 16,000 chickens to accumulate the matter, the, the waste products, for five years and they have no problems whatsoever. There are hen houses now that are in existence around the country that have been gone for more than 15 years without ever cleaning around those things. They've never gone into cleaning. Um, you will get used to the smell after a period of time because you, it's going to stay. The other problem is there's fumes and there's all kinds of these things. And how do you get rid of that stuff? We have to look at ventilation. Ventilation, and we talked about this last week, but we're going to look at it again briefly here. The ventilation would clear out most of that smell and any noxious gases that come with it. So they probably wouldn't have anything else. Manure gas, could that be a problem? Could be, but highly unlikely. The ventilation would take care of that as well. There's many things that they could have done with all this thing. The, ven the ventilation would take care of almost all of that. And it's only 371 days for the whole thing. So, the ventilation and the lighting. I mean, look, you looked at this last week. For some people that didn't see it, if you look at ventilation, we talked about the window. The window that was in the thing says it was going to be one cubit high. The word window in Hebrew means high noon. All right? It literally is translated as noon. It can also be translated as window. So if you said there was going to be a window, that's the same time as saying at noon. Right there, right? So that's the same word, in the window and the high noon up there. When you do that, it means the window would probably be down the entire length of the ship, up in the top. And it would be one cubit high, about 18 inches, 20 inches high. And that could be open. So in this particular case here, they're showing that they can open these things up through that top piece. And two things. They've shown that with a study that wind blowing through one section of this, just one section of window open, would blow all the way through the ark and could come out in another area. Um, and we had lots of wind probably during that arc. What about the rain coming down? It, you can have, don't you open the windows when it rains? Yeah, but I don't know because have one on top of me. But, but again, they're showing this thing here as being a ventilation this way, but the th windows could be in the sides. They're showing actually the windows in the sides with the light coming in. Okay? Okay. So there, it's, it's a compounding and how they can do it. The other thing is people say, well, they're probably not that smart. These people are stupid, you know, like they've been evolving for millions of years, so they wouldn't be that smart. I think I said this before last week too. I have a personal theory which says the sum total of all intelligence on the earth is constant. In other words, Adam and Eve had all of the intelligence on the earth, and now that we have seven billion people, we're so stupid, we have one seven billionth of the uh, intelligence that Adam and Eve had. The more people we have, the more stupid we get. That's my theory. <laughs> but anyway, I believe they had lots of intelligence there, and God was with them. We talked about the design. God probably helped them with the design in many ways. We don't know a lot of that, but again, there's many of those things. The other thing is, I also pointed out that if they took, a, a, made a tube from the top all the way down to the bottom in two places, what would happen is as 
hot air went up, and from all these animals, as the hot air went up, it could be going out through the thing, and then cold air would come in to the bottom and ventilate that way. So you could have natural ventilation through actual just tubes. Many things are done that way today. Natural ventilation is, uh, is a very easy way. There's no power, there's no nothing, and it carries all that away. So ventilation is not a problem on the Earth. But the, the lighting, when you get to the lighting, we talked about that last week, and again, this is the concept they use. They're looking at oil lamps. And these things were gimbaled, they could fill them up with oil, they could, you know, use them up. Problem is that that is a fire. And you're on a ship. It's a wooden ship. You've got straw. You've got all kinds of things. Um, so that may not have been what they did. So it was asked last week, how else could you do it? Glow bugs, fireflies. Literally, if you collect those things, you could put them in a jar, and they will literally give you illumination that you can see enough to get around and do things right there. Wouldn't be pleasant, but still, it's, it gives you enough illumination to be able to see. So there are ways to do that. The other concept was, many people say, well, because it was um, uh, God's command <clears throat> to have an ark and put the animals there, <clears throat> he may have put all the animals into hibernation. We'll get to this in a minute. But the whole concept is that, no, God did not put them into hibernation. So the question is, coming up, how could eight people look after all those animals? If they're not hibernating, how could they look after them? There's 7,000 animals today on a cattle farm. How many people does it take to look after 5,000 cows? One. How many workers does it take for 30,000 hens? 30,000 hens. One. For 3,840 pigs, how many workers does it take to take care of them? Are you getting the point? 6,000 small animals could be looked after by one person. Right? On the ark, we had one worker for 2,000 animals, even less, 7,000 animals total. So they're only looking after less than 2,000 animals, all right? So it's quite feasible, even based on what we're doing today. In the agriculture and in the fields out there today, one person looks after all kinds of these things. Now, how do they do it? First of all, they're going to use all kinds of labor-saving devices. What kind of things like that? Self-feeders. How many of you have a dog? <laughs> How many times do you, do you put down one little dish of water? Or do you go out and get the big bottle that automatically it runs for four days, right? That's a week. Now it's out of here we put a little dish. But you can get this great big jug and the water will just keep filling it up automatically until it runs out. <clears throat> they could be doing that with water. They could be doing it with feed. Um, if you take um, a lot of different animals, you have a, a tube, you fill it with food, and the animal's down at the bottom of a little trough, and he just eats, and as it, it just continually runs down, right? So they may only have to feed some of these animals once a week or once every two weeks. They just dump the stuff into these feeders, sell things. They could have plumbing for water. They could have had plumbing to take care of all the urine and so on. And how do they make plumbing? How could you make plumbing? They didn't have plastic. They didn't have, they might, they might have had brass. They might have had steel. But how would they make plumbing? How about Clay. bamboo? Bamboo is a very natural thing to make into plumbing, right? And you could put all kinds of stuff to run it through and uh, take it off into some area where you wanted to get rid of it. They could have had augers. We use augers in a lot of factories now. The farmers do the same thing. If you want to transfer grain, they use augers. It's just a big screw, and you know, they can just turn to them. They could even have taken some of the animals and hooked them up and made a you know, power system that would drive these different things for various purposes. But now, the most critical task that they need would be completed in less than half of a workday. It's considered that a normal workday is 10 hours. It, actually, it's 12 hours, 12 hours, sun up to sundown. There's a biblical workday. So they're figuring five hours. And the other thing is, the Bible says there's six workdays in a week. Not five, not four, there's six. 12 hour days. That's a normal, we're, we're very, I guess we can call it that. 
Because work days, according to the Bible, are six days a week, 12 hours a day. But less than half of that would take care of all of the critical things that had to be done. So you'd have eight people doing this much work. Now, <clears throat> start to look at a few pictures here. This is the concept I was talking about before, where if you if you see these cages, right, there's a, well, easier on this side, there's a board back here. So any fecal matter and so on would come down and just fall down to the bottom. This one here would come off of here, and this one would just drop onto it. Then it comes down and there's a, um, a trough along the bottom. And all I would have to do is take a shovel and just scoop right along there, and I could clean the whole thing up very quickly. Right? So when at the ark, at the actual Answers in Genesis ark, you would literally see that kind of an area. This is the area. The cages are made out of wood. This is actually a, a picture that's taken here. <clears throat> and all these small cages, and they're showing you can go through them, you can see all these things and how they would do that. Um, the interesting thing about this, this is on the first, uh, the first deck, right? so basically the bottom of the ship. Remember we talked about the door was in on the second floor because it said the door would have one lower deck and one upper deck. Right? So there would be three decks. The Bible tells us that. The door would be on the second one. So the small animals, they could take into the ark and bring them down to the bottom. The bigger animals would stay on that main deck, right? the second deck. The third deck would be for the humans, the birds, and so on, as you'll see in the pictures here. So the interesting thing is when you get in there, and you, mind you, you've got to remember, there, there could be thousands of people in the ark at the same time. But as you get in this area here, you stop and you just stand there and look. You can't see animals in there because they're just, you know, slats under things. There's no animals there. But what you hear is the sounds of <coughs> hundreds of animals squeaking and squealing and so on. And you hear wind and water splashing up against the side of the ship. It's amazing as you stand there. Just, I mean, but again, you've got to remember, there's hundreds of people who are going to be standing around these areas through all these, you kind of wander through and you can see all these. People are talking and they're taking pictures. But still, just stop and you listen. And you can just, you can almost imagine yourself laying on the ark. And you can hear the animals, and you can hear the wind and the water and everything else. So it's, it's amazing how they set that up. <coughs> this picture is taken on the very top of the ship. That's the uh, upper deck up there. And this is supposed to be a display of Noah retrieving the dove. You can see just above his outstretched right hand, there's a bird there. And this is supposedly after Noah sends the dove out and it comes back. Um, so there's various things, but all of these cages up on the top are where they would have, they, they think they might have had birds up in there. And then on the middle deck, they have cages. And you can go through these things. And so all of these cages are laid up. Now, you see up on the above the cages, you see there's a, a man up there, that's it's one of the uh, you know mannequins or whatever. He's got a wheelbarrow, and you can see a chute right in front of the wheelbarrow. And that would be a feeder. You can see at various places these things where they would go along and they would just be able to dump food down into these feeders and it would feed the animals down below. So as you go through, you'll see all of these different ways in which these things could be done. <coughs> now, I've got a bunch of pictures here of the kind of animals that you get to see in there. Now, the one thing that you have to recognize is that we looked at a picture of a roller bear, we looked at a picture of a zonkey. They're not normal. But remember, we have a dog kind. Two of the dog kind. From those two, we have poodles, we have terriers, we have wolves, we have dingoes, we have foxes. They all came from that two animals. So what did those original two animals look like? Because again, does a wolf look like a poodle? Same family, and they can be bred together. They, you know, they've experimented with this stuff. You can do that. It's all the same thing. It's the same kind. But what do they look like? So what they do is they have license. They have to take artistic license. This is what they consider the bear kind. The two of the bear kind. They don't know for sure, but again, they put it together. And do not ask me what the animals are. But these are the kind of animals that you can see in there. There's two in all of these cages. They're doing different things. Um, again, I don't know the names. I probably should have looked them up when I was taking, copying these pictures. But um, 
again here you can see up on top above there he's feeding uh, food into that chute which would come down to the bottom and you see down on the bottom at the gate there would be a trough that would be water in there that you know the watering thing could be in there and it would just you know come down as they needed it extinct animals we looked at all these fossils these are fossilized animals uh, to me I I would think there might be a uh, The birds, uh, pterodactyl. pterodactyl, that's what I was thinking, yes, right, uh, but anyway, maybe, I don't know, I didn't bother, you know, looking at all these things and what they were. Um, again, in here, you can see that uh, this is one of the wives in there, and she's uh, down there, and she's feeding these animals, they're gentle animals, and, you know, we're talking to them, whatever has to go on, and again, you can see in the middle there, there would be a water trough in the middle, uh, their food would be somewhere out there. And remember, only 10% of the animals were bigger than a big dog, right? So there's not a lot of these things. <coughs> Dinosaurs, Stegosaurus, I know these are Stegosaurus there, I know them. Uh, and again, how big would they, giant would they be? But again, they're absolutely fascinating. Again, the problem you get into with this is that there's hundreds of people all trying to get in there. They've all got cameras, they're all sticking through the bars, and flash, 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 flash. flash. And uh, I did the same thing, so I got some pictures of my camera, but I take these out of their book. Um, all different kinds of animals. Now, they have, they have reasons for doing this. They have looked at these different kinds, and they put them together. Incidentally, these things are all made from uh, 3D printing and styrofoam. Um, and um, I've got videos on these guys doing it. They show you how they did it There's, and how they talk to these guys. Um, the, they say that these things are just lumps of material until all of a sudden you start putting the eyes on them. And all of a sudden you've got a real live animal. They said it's amazing how the eyes make a difference in all of these things. Um, interesting thing. Um, I did tell you last week that the ark um, cost $110 million and it was totally built on donations. Um, the other part is that the people who are there Answers in Genesis never asked for anybody to come to work there. They had people call them up from Hollywood. You know, these people that do all the makeup and all these different things and do all those animatronics and do these things. They called them up and said, we hear that you're building an art. We'd like to be involved. They took huge cuts in pay to be able to go there. They're still working there. These people are still there. They're still making displays. So, not one person was requested to come in. They didn't advertise and say, we need so-and-so. Somebody come up and says, I think I can do this for you. God sent the people that they needed to get this done. And they came in, I mean, they took huge cuts in pay from what they've been doing, many of them, to do these things. So it's absolutely amazing when you get there and you start seeing all these things for real. But, <clears throat> here's the question. Why does it matter that eight people were able to care for 7,000 animals? Who cares? Next picture, I want you to tell me something. What's the most important thing that you can see in that picture? Come well, on, you guys were here last week, I told you. What's the most important thing in that whole picture? The door with the eyes shut. The door! Because you had to go through that door to be saved. And what do we have to do to be saved? We have to go through the door of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it's John, I wrote it down here. John uh, 10 9 says, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. Jesus is the door. That's the most important single aspect of this whole thing. And when you're there at the ark, Everything is geared towards that door. They want you to see this. And of course, people are coming in. And the first time I went there, of course, I'm just, you're amazed at this whole structure. The second time, you can't do it in one day. Don't, you can see the thing in one day, but you've got to go back another day. And when you go back the second time, you start to see more. And you'll see that they are concentrating everything towards that door. Because the only way you're going to get saved is to come through that door. When you 
you through that door, you're on your own now. That's it. Do what you want, you're on your own, right? Let's make it emphatic. No! You are not on your own. When you go through the door for salvation, you are never on your own. Let's look at this. Psalm 103. There's many of these different things, but let's read this. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all thy iniquities? Who heals all your diseases? Who redeems your life from destruction? Who crowns thee with loving kindness and tender mercies? Who satisfies your mouth with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles? Very simple. Who is looking after you? God. <clears throat> so what do we care about these eight people on the ark? God made a provision to save those animals. He's saving his creation. He made the provision. And he put those people there to care for those animals. But with us now, once we are saved, once we enter through the door with Christ, he himself looks after us. We, I believe in heaven, will have many duties to do. But he's going to be looking after us overall. If we jump up to Psalm 147. Praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises unto our God, for it is pleasant and praise is coming. The Lord does build up Jerusalem. He gathers together the outcasts of Israel. He heals the broken in heart and binds up their wounds. He tells the number of the stars. He calls them by all, their all by their names. Great is our Lord and of great power. His understanding is infinite. The Lord lifteth up the meek. He casts the wicked down to the ground. He's talking about those people that have entered in Christ. He's not talking about everybody. Not everybody has these benefits. You have to go through Christ in order to get that. Continuing on. It says, Praise the Lord, O Jerusalem. Praise thy God, O Zion. For he has strengthened the bars of thy gates. He has blessed the children within thee. He makes peace in thy borders and fills thee with the finest of the wheat. He sends forth his commandment upon earth. His word runneth very swiftly. He gives snow like wool. He scatters the hoarfrost like ashes. He casts forth his ice like morsels. Who can stand before his cold? He sends out his worry and melts them. He causes his wind to blow and the waters flow. We are not alone once we have salvation. Once you enter that door, just as Noah looked after the animals, God, his son, the spirit, all of them, they're one. There's three in one. They will be looking after us. So God's our heavenly and our spiritual father. Absolutely. <clears throat> when we enter through the salvation through the door, God's going to take care of us from that day forward. Right? Dean and I were talking about this just a while ago. We will backslide. And he will chastise us at times. There's different things happen. When you repent, when you ask for forgiveness and whatever you've done, he will be back there and he will continue to take care of you. He still continues to help us. He never leaves us is the point Dale Dean made. God never leaves us. We leave him at times, but he never leaves us. We have to remember that all the time. So, when you look at the ark encounter, they're always gearing towards that entire aspect. We have to go to the aspect that the only way to be saved is through the door of Christ. And when you do enter that door, God is there and he will look after us, just as he looked after all of these animals and so on here. Next week, I've got two videos that are <coughs> shown in there at the ark. We're going to have both of those. One of them is called the Noah Interview. And the Noah Interview takes place, Dean saw it last week, it takes place just before the flood comes. Right? Noah is being interviewed. And it's strange. The second one is called, as it was, as it was in the days of Noah. The interesting thing is, these two films have exactly, precisely the exact same actors. The first one is in the days of Noah, the second one happens today. They're all in exactly the same positions. <clears throat> Noah, in the first one, is Noah getting on the ark. In the second one, Noah is supposedly the general manager of the ark encounter, it answers in Genesis. 
and he's being interviewed. They have the same people. And they're amazing how they tie these two things together. Um, the, you know, there's a lot of things to learn about the ark and what's going on. But again, it's more of an evangelical thing. Um, you know, and how this thing happens. So, we'll leave that for next week. Does anybody have any questions? Did they have glass in those days? Because you said they would really put the globe on the glass, the glass jar. Yeah. They had glass in sure. those days? Yeah. How, where does glass come from? From the earth. But I didn't yeah. understand you know how to do it then. But, so I guess they... Why wouldn't they? <laughs> I mean, people say, well, well, these were ignorant people three million years ago. They had to... It, the greatest invention was the wheel. Well, wait a minute. I believe they had the wheel. Adam had a wheel. I believe that, right? Adam was not a stupid man. I mean, they would learn this very quickly. They had fire, right? Right from the start. They had all of these things. And as I said, my own personal theory is we're more stupid now than any of these old people were. They were far more intelligent. They may not have had the technology that we have, but they had far more intelligence. So glass is coming from melting sand. All you gotta do is have a fire on a beach. And if it gets hot enough, you can pick up pieces of glass. And if you get it hot, they can melt. They can do things, right? They, we know that they had bronze, and we know that they had iron. Mm -hmm. They were doing things before that. We're told that in uh, the first couple of chapters of Genesis, right. that uh, these things were there. We know they had music instruments. One of the things that we uh, showed last week in the pictures is that, um, and people don't think about this, you've got eight people, eight humans going in the ark. And they would have a lot of work to do. Even if it's only five hours, it's still going to be a lot of work to do. Six days a week to do these things. And yes, they would take a day off. They would be worshiping God. Right? But the, the thing is, they needed a nice, well-appointed residence to live in. So they probably set up themselves with beautiful rooms. They had to take music with them. They had musical instruments. They would be artists. They would have art supplies. They would have their own hobbies and crafts. Um, they would be able to do wood carving. They would do those kind of things. On the ark itself, because they had to do repairs and they had to carry things, they would have a blacksmith shop. They would have a woodworking shop. They would have different shops right on the ark to be able to make repairs. All of these things are highly probable, very highly probable. And it would bring all of these things through the flood on the technology on the other side. Because they had that stuff. So, um, glass, yes, absolutely. I believe they had that. They had metal working. Some of the metals they didn't have, and we've got stuff now that we, you know, people never heard of some of these things. Oh, it just popped into my head. Has anybody here ever heard of metallic hydrogen? Do you know what hydrogen is? Right? It's a gas, right? It's explosive. And two parts of that with one part of oxygen, and you get water, right? But hydrogen. A guy in 1920 theorized that if you took hydrogen and if you made it cold enough, it would become a solid. It would be absolutely crystal clear. It would be clearer than any glass we've ever made. It would be, uh, there was a whole, whole, it would be a metal, metal. And it would, could shape it, you could bend it, you could twist it in anything you wanted. In 2001, scientists actually made metallic hydrogen at really cold, like minus 400 degrees Fahrenheit. Now they can do it at room temperature and pressure. They can make metallic hydrogen. And there's a huge theory that goes along with that. <clears throat> In Genesis 1, it says on day 2, God made the firmament to separate the waters from the waters. The word firmament in Hebrew is rakia. Rakia means to be pounded into thin metal sheets. Yeah. It's in Strong's Dictionary. It's in Strong's Concordance. If you want to look it up. It says, it's, it's from a root word that says to be pounded into thin metal sheets. Well then, now what's the firmament with waters and waters, right? There's all kinds of stuff. One theory is this. It says it rained for 40 days and 40 nights. Right now, today, if it started raining from every cloud on the whole earth, how long would the rain last? Two days. It'd be gone. There'd be no clouds left. How did it rain 40 days and 40 nights, assuming it covered the whole earth? This thing grows up into a huge theory on that, right? 
Sometimes if you've got hours and you want to get into that, we'll get into that one, but I'm not going to carry it any further. Oh, the Lord so, can do anything. He can send I absolutely agree. Water. I know, I agree. <laughs> but again, part of it was it opened the great deep, right? Mm -hmm. And so when this came up, there was water coming from the great deep. Now, what was the great deep? And what was the water doing there? There's a huge theory that goes with that, too. And I believe the entire earth is going to be recreated back to what it was at that point in time. Mm -hmm. And so there's going to be amazing things, right? So... But the permanent, the permanent was, there must have been a huge amount of water, like a big, in a big kind of a dome or something. Because yep. there was never any rain, yep. and, and it was a mist, mist. And water, yep. Yep. And, and the sun didn't get through it, it scorch and destroy. Well, and yeah, that comes down to this metallic hydrogen bit. Right? Oh, okay, right. Because metallic hydrogen doesn't let any uh, infrared through. No, what is, no, it's UV. UV is what hurts yeah. us, isn't it? That's it doesn't let the ultraviolet out, out, out through. That's infrared through but not the UV. It's a total block on it. So again, we can, I can spend another two hours talking just on that stuff. Uh, we were talking about uh, the water spilling the whole earth and covering the mouths, as, as you pointed out there. It said um, that it, uh, the water rolls 15 cubits, which is like 22 and a half feet. Yep, yep. You've got to cover all the mountains. Yep, how high were the mountains? Very low. Until until all this turmoil come and the mountains went after that. The seas went all down. the mountains came up after. There were hills, is all they were, right? Covered the highest hill by that much. So there were, there were, we didn't have Himalayas, we didn't have Rocky Mountains, we didn't have all these things. They only came up during, at the end of the flood, right? And started rising up. They were not there in the original part. How is it that we find palm trees at the Antarctic? There's palm trees in the Antarctic. And seashells down the bottom of the Grand Canyon, things right. like that. There's all kinds of stuff like this. But it means that the entire world was at uniform temperature, right? Around the whole world, right? So again, um, many interesting things to get into that stuff. Um, there was some, oh, I, just to give you a point of water. Um, uh, I used to be a scuba diver. There was a place down in Florida called Planet Ocean. Carol and I went there once. And, and when you walked into this Planet Ocean, they had an eight foot sphere. And it was, you know, all the continents and everything on it. And right beside it, they had a pedestal. And on the pedestal, they had a cup, like this. And they said, if the Earth were shrunk to the size of this thing, right, to the size of this thing, eight feet in diameter, this is the total amount of water that's on the Earth today. What's in one cup? So when you consider the size of the Earth, Right? Eight foot diameter, and this is the whole water that you can see how much is there. It's only just a skin, a little skim of the surface. But again, it's amazing stuff. Anyway, what else? Alright, let's have a prayer. Oh, yeah, I was going to say too. If you, I've got books on these things. Uh, some people have already taken some, but I've got books. If you wanted to get more into the animals, I've got DVDs at home and so on. So if you're interested in getting any more of these things, then just let me know. I've got different ones here. There's some textbooks, there's some books. And um, for those who are interested, um, I mentioned last week that uh, two of the people at Answers in Genesis are writing a fictional account of Noah's wife. Um, they call his wife in Zara. And uh, Donna has the book now. It's a novel, right? And it's made up. It's a fascinating book. It's absolutely fascinating. It's going to be a three-part series. And I was saying last Wednesday, part one. I want part two. Where's part two? Come on. I gotta get this one. <laughs> Thursday, I got a notice in the mail. Guess what's out now? Part two. I bought the second book. I don't get it. It says it'll take three weeks to get here. So part two is on the way. Now you got to wait now because we're screaming for part three. But, but it's a it's a it's a fictional book, but it's absolutely fascinating book. It's just outstanding with that thing. So Answers in Genesis has it. It's called Noah, a Man of Destiny, and uh, I don't know if you like it or not. I love it. Uh, it's, it. It's a really good book, and so it's kind of a cliffhanger at the end. And then I want the next book. So anyway.